My name is Dan Price. I am a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, syndicated newspaper columnist, and informal educator. Today we're going to talk about my favorite mission, the Voyager missions. They were launched in 1977 and they are the greatest mission in the history of NASA and it was the greatest voyage of discovery in the history of humankind. We're going to focus in on just a small portion of that mission today and talk about the golden records that were carried on both of those spacecraft. That alone is fascinating and reveals the genius of our engineering and the potential that we have as human beings to do great things. So I hope I can get you as excited about the Voyager missions as I clearly am. So to start off with, why did we send records into space? And forgive me if from time to time I say record or Voyager when I mean records and Voyagers. I know there's two spacecraft, I know there's two records. Understood. Why? Why would we send a record? It's outmoded technology already, right? We don't, I mean, yeah, sure, I have a bunch of records, but who cares? Nobody listens to them anymore. It's simple, though. It's easy to understand. It's easy to explain to, hopefully, an extraterrestrial civilization how to play that record. And that's a big part of what we're going to talk about today are the instructions that are printed on the cover of those golden records. The second thing that should strike us as a little bit odd about sending records into space aboard pretty tiny spacecraft is who's going to find them? Like, the chances of them being located by anyone are astronomical, sorry, uh, but they're pretty slim. Well, why try anything then, right? Like, we've got to have hope that at some point in the future, some other civilization will stumble upon these relics from Earth from goodness knows how long ago and be able to learn a little bit about our culture in the process. But the Voyager records aren't the first attempt that we've made to contact alien civilizations or at least alert them to our presence. Of course, we've been broadcasting radio signals since we've had radio. We've been broadcasting television signals. We've been shooting airport radar up into the air. There are ways to detect us, but we hadn't tried anything so intentional and so physical until we launched Pioneer 10. The Golden Records, like everything in science, is a cooperative enterprise that spans the generations, as Carl Sagan has said. It's a house built brick by brick, one on top of the other. And those Pioneer plaques served as the foundation for what became the Voyager Records. The Pioneer plaques themselves are genius. I mentioned Carl Sagan briefly. He is the impetus behind the Pioneer plaques and behind the Voyager Golden Records. The Pioneer spacecraft were the first to achieve escape velocity from our solar system, meaning they really were our first interstellar messengers. So realizing this, Sagan thought that it's a heck of a good idea maybe to put some sort of message on there. But what a heavy burden. What message are you gonna put on there? And again, how are you going to make that something that's universal and easily understood by an alien culture? Think about this. You have to design something that is going to be universal. You have to be able to communicate with an alien civilization that has almost no common frame of reference. They have nothing in common with our culture, we have to assume. They don't have the same numbers, they don't have the same alphabets. I mean, we don't have that across the globe, how many different languages are there. It takes a lot for us to understand each other, and some languages are being lost forever. So we had to agree on a common language, and math is that, math and physics. Everything is the same everywhere. The spectrum that I see from the hyperfine transition of a neutral hydrogen atom's electron is the same here as it is in the Andromeda galaxy, as it is halfway across the universe. It doesn't matter. It's the same. It's universal. So let's use that. It's the simplest atom that we have, and it's the most abundant. And any extraterrestrial civilization that's capable of discovering the Voyagers or the Pioneer spacecraft 
would have discovered this hyperfine transition. Let's talk about that in a little bit more detail and look at what we put on the Pioneer plaques to show exactly that. What in the heck is the hyperfine transition of a neutral hydrogen atom anyway? Well, really, it's just a fancy way to say that the energy level of an atom changes. Um, this is the representation that appears on the Pioneer plaque and the Voyager Golden Record. Uh, hydrogen represented here is the simplest atom in the universe. It has just one proton and one electron. Uh, that one electron shown here undergoes a change in energy level, which is called a spin flip and is really due to the magnetic moment of the whole system. But, you know, we don't need to know all that. Um, it ends up at a new energy level, though, once it over undergoes this transition. So when electrons in any kind of atom change their energy levels, they emit a packet of light called a photon at a specific wavelength. This is the basis of spectroscopy and allows us to identify elements across the universe just by looking at them. Uh, the photon emitted here has a wavelength of 21 centimeters and a period of seven billionths of a second. Light travels, in fact, 21 centimeters in seven billionths of a second. That's the relationship there. Uh, in this diagram, we represent that transition with this tick mark. That symbol is now our standard measure of time and distance. So with that spin flip of the neutral hydrogen atoms electron, we have a basis for time, about seven billionths of a second, and we have a basis for distance, again, that 21 centimeters. Uh, how do we express numbers? We are familiar here in the United States and Canada uh, and around most of the world with Arabic numerals but they don't use those on Alpha Centauri. They don't use that on Pegasus 4 or wherever. They use something completely different and we have no way to understand what symbolism they use to represent numbers in their culture. So we tried to use the simplest thing possible and that's binary. We use it for all of our computers. It's a one or a zero, it's on or off. And we can build upon it and show how that works pretty easily. Instead of a one and a zero, we used a vertical line and a horizontal line. The vertical line being one or on, the horizontal line being zero or off. Let's look at the first few numbers in binary to see how that works. So here's one. We move over to the right one space to make two. We add that on switch to make three. So two lines next to each other is three in binary. I'll bet you can guess what four is. So there you go. We can represent any number that way. Yeah, it's going to be incredibly long, but it's pretty simple once we lay it out. Counting is easy. Animals, lots of animals can do it. We're animals. We can count. So we had hoped that an alien civilization would be able to figure that out pretty easily. So there, pretty quickly, we've got a common language. We've got numbers, and we've got time and distance. Again, that neutral hydrogen atom is the bomb. It shows us everything we need to know, practically. But now, what are we going to try to communicate to these aliens? Are we just going to say hello? Like, that's pretty lame. What are we going to tell them exactly? Well, let's start by telling them where we are. And that's something that the Voyager records and the Pioneer plaques share in common, is this pulsar map. On this map, we see 15 lines radiating away from a central point. Each one of these represents, by its length, the relative distance to a pulsar, and by the binary code on those lines, how long that pulsar takes to spin once. Pulsars spin incredibly fast. They're neutron stars um, that emit pulses of radiation. So it's pretty easy for an alien civilization to say, okay, well, we've mapped pulsars around the galaxy, and these numbers seem to correlate. We can then figure out the distance, and they can figure out one more thing as well. They can figure out how long ago that message was sent, because pulsars don't spin at the same rate forever. There's no such thing as perpetual motion. 
they spin down over time. They get a little bit slower all the time. They radiate away their energy in gravitational waves and in other ways as well. So they can also calculate how long ago that message was sent. There's another line on here, this one that goes straight across, and that represents the distance of our sun from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So there you have a map to find us. Some people don't think that's a great idea. Don't tell the aliens where we are. They're going to come and get us. Eh, we'll be long dead by then. It'll be our children that will inherit, inherit the problem, which seems like a common thing for us to do these days, as a matter of fact. I'd love to talk about the rest of the Pioneer plaque, but we're going to save that for another time and focus in on the golden record. So the similarities between the two end there, because there is no record included on the Pioneer plaques. The rest of what appears on the golden record are instructions on exactly how you play that golden record, which seems like a great idea. So let's look at that in a little bit of detail. So first, let's look at this top picture of the record. Around the outside of this disc is the rotation speed in binary and hydrogen time, let's call it. Obviously, we can't put things in minutes and seconds. We've already got that agreed upon time measurement system. So the rotation speed around the outside of the record and a depiction of the stylus so they know what to do with the thing. For those of you that don't know what a stylus is, it's basically the needle that you put into the groove of the record. They should be able to figure out which direction the record rotates just because that groove is a, a concentric circle that just moves towards the middle. So we see it placed on the outside here in this uh, diagram, so they know to start there. So that should be pretty easy for them to figure out. They know what to do. They should be able to play the record to at least hear the sounds because there are more than sounds on this record, which is also incredible. The lower picture of the record on its side, showing the stylus above it here, uh, has the playtime per side, again in that binary hydrogen code that we've developed, so they know how long that record should take to play, and if they're doing it correctly, and if they're hearing the sounds right, so they have a way to kind of cross-check whether or not they're doing it properly. So that's pretty neat also. There's a lot of great ideas that went into this record for sure. Like I said, it's not all sound that's on here, though. We managed to put images on here as well. And that's what this side of the cover to the Golden Record shows an alien civilization how to access. Along the top here is a depiction of what the general waveforms will look like. So there's also a binary representation of one, two, and three. Again, to further reinforce things, like hopefully in this short period of time, you've all learned how to read that binary code. And even if the aliens haven't at this point, I mean, you can bet that they're putting their best scientists on it to figure it out. So that's just yet another clue to help them along the path. It also shows how that waveform is read out. So the pictures are crafted by 512 vertical lines. We see the picture being created, that vertical line going down, and then a return. And then the line being drawn, and then a return. So again, we have that one, two, three along the binary side of things. I should also mention that it shows below that first waveform on the far left here, uh, in binary, how long that should take to read out, and it's about 8 milliseconds. Uh, you can copy this down and plug it into Google and uh, try to convert to binary and then do the multiplication yourself. You'll see how it all works out. It's Again, it's, it's ingenious. It's absolutely ingenious. So after we've built up that first picture, what's it supposed to look like? Well, this circle. We chose something simple, something that we would be able to, well, the aliens would be able to determine whether or not they did the right thing or not. And a circle is a, a pretty simple thing to do. So now that you and I and the aliens know how to play this record, what's on the thing anyway? Well, there's music. 
So there's music from a wide variety of different cultures of humans on Earth. There's also whale song. There are about 115 different images on there. And there's greetings in 55 different human languages, as well as the brainwave patterns, about an hour's worth of Andrewian. I would love to show you all of those pictures, but they're copyright protected. Uh, I hope they are able to enforce that when the aliens find it and start printing t-shirts with images from Earth on it, because I know that's like the first thing that I would do. So I'm sure that our Earth lawyers will find a way to travel to the stars in order to litigate against aliens who are using copyright protected material. I don't have anything against copyrights. It's just a little bit weird, right? I mean, it's on a golden record in space and it's copyrighted. So sorry, I can't show you all that stuff. There is one last thing that I'd like to talk about before we go here today, though. On that cover of the golden record is a thin coating of uranium-238. Again, this is something that's universal. Uranium-238 has a specific half-life. It's a tiny but detectable amount of uranium, and any alien civilization, again, that's able to find either one of the Voyager spacecraft would be able to detect that decay of uranium and calculate from the daughter particles left over from how much of that uranium has decayed how long ago the spacecraft launched. So it's really got it all. It's, you know, in a simple record, it encompasses so much of humanity, both in its content and in the way it was created and produced. I could never have thought of something like that, never in a million years, but the genius of Carl Sagan and Frank Drake and Andrew Ian and all of these other folks working together to produce this record shows just how well we can do as a species. It shows how our genius can spread out to the galaxy to reach out with a mission of hope like the Voyagers and hopefully contact another civilization and prove, finally, that we're not alone in the universe. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Nice to be in orbit. Thank you so much for watching today. I would love to talk for hours about the Voyager spacecraft, but eh, this video is probably too long already. If you like it, please like it. You can subscribe to my channel. I'll be producing one of these a month at least. Who knows, maybe I'll increase frequency as time goes on and we continue to deal with the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic. Hopefully it ends soon for all of us, but in the meantime, uh, this is one of the ways that I'll be reaching out. So again, subscribe to my channel, like it, visit my blog. I write regularly, at least every week, about space and physics and astronomy, and I'd like to take you along on that journey that I've been going on my entire life. So thanks a lot and have a great day.